going to really introduce the overall general idea with a single slide. Uh, and that is basically just one that sort of outlines this idea that evolution and ecology interact, reinforce each other, and feedback. And so you have an interaction between ecological dynamics at different levels that are influencing uh, selection on phenotypes, and then the evolution and phenotypic plasticity of those phenotypes will then have effects on populations, communities, and ecosystems. So I've written a lot about this uh, in this book here. I was initially going to introduce this overall general idea, but in the end, I think it's more exciting for me to talk about some of the empirical work that we're doing in a model system that is starting to look at evolutionary dynamics. And the system I want to talk about is Darwin's finches and the Galapagos plants. So traditionally, we know that the evolution of Darwin's finches and different species has been driven by adaptation to different plants in the Galapagos. So you have ecological diversification and variation in shaping the evolution of traits. And so we've done a lot of work on that, as have a lot of other people. Uh, my student, Luis de Leon, was the person who led the work that he did on this. And we've done a lot of work basically asking in this evolutionary perspective how the communities of plants, in particular seeds that are generated by the plants, then influence selection on the beaks of the finches. And we continue to work on this with uh, looking in particular at integrating data sets across different research groups to ask about spatial and temporal dynamics in the beaks of the finches. So here we have Daphne Major uh, and two of our sites on the island of Santa Cruz. We have four different ground fish species. You see there's a lot of spatial variation in those uh, beak size and shape. It's relatively stable through time. And so we're asking about how that spatial variation is being shaped by spatial variation in the plants that the finches are feeding on. And also doing a lot of work uh, started with Jaime Chavez on the genetic basis of these morphological traits in Darwin's finches where it turns out that there are relatively few genes that seem to be strongly influencing beak size. And so given that beak size is having effects on uh, plants and other aspects of the Galapagos, these might be keystone genes. But what I want to talk about today is newer work that we have only really just getting started on publishing, but I think it's kind of exciting to flip the story now and ask about how the evolution of those beaks is shaping spatial and temporal dynamics of the plants. In particular, the community structure, but also the evolution of particular plants within that system. So I just want to talk a little bit about the work that we're doing, spearheaded by uh, my student Sophia, uh, in collaboration with a lot of other people. And so now, basically, we're looking, we're flipping that story from the ecology shaping the evolution of finches to the evolution of finches starting to shape the ecology. Now, our first major question was simply to ask, what are the effects that finches have on seeds and plants in the lab? I was uh, sort of talking to various people about this, and the ideal thing would be we go out and get one site and shoot all the large beak finches, <laughs> and we go to some other site and shoot all the small beak finches. But we can't do that, unfortunately, so instead we have to start by doing exclosures. So the idea is let's keep finches out, and then if we look at the effects of finches when we get rid of them, we can then later go to places with different beak size distributions and say if they have different effects when you exclude them. So this is the initial experiments we've done, where we did uh, finch exposures, you just keep the finches out at one location, well, a couple of locations on one island, and then you have control plots beside that. And so the first thing we wanted to ask simply was, are the finches having effects on the numbers of seeds that are in the soil, so in the seed bank? And so uh, through time, over these uh, three or four year period, we can compare control plots to the plots where the finches, so control plots where the finches can feed to exposure plots where the finches couldn't feed. And so the expectation will be that there'll be more intact seeds in the places where the finches aren't allowed to feed if finches are affecting seeds. And so uh, that's indeed what we see here, is that over the entire period, starting even in the first year, where the finches are excluded, you have more intact seeds. Now, in principle, that could be driven by things other than finch predation. So a quick check on whether it's finches that are doing this is we can look also in those plots at the seeds that have been cracked by finches. So the seeds leave a, a remnant, a husk, after the finches feed on them that's quite distinctive. And so we can see now if this depletion of seeds when finches are present is indeed being driven by finches, then we should have more cracked seeds in the places where finches can feed. And indeed, that's the case. 
So it does seem like finches are really decreasing the seeds available in the soil, and they're doing so quite quickly. So finches are depleting seeds from the ground. But are they structuring the community of plants that are represented by those seeds? So the next thing we wanted to ask was to ask whether finches are influencing the diversity of plants in the seed distribution and also in the emergent plant distribution when the rains come back. And so uh, here we're looking at just a Shannon diversity index where you have, if the data points are above the line, then finches are increasing the diversity of seeds, and if the data points are below the line, finches are decreasing the diversity of seeds in the, the context of species distribution. And it appears that finches are actually structuring this plant communities by increasing seed diversity. And then we also look to see whether they're influencing plant diversity. And there does seem to be a bit of an effect, but it's weaker. So you don't have a strong effect until the last year, suggesting that there's a little bit of a disconnect between the life cycle, the life stage of the plants that the finches are directly feeding on, and the next stage. Suggesting that this germination period is something where you might break eco evo feedbacks or at least weaken them. And so we have a, way, a series of questions that we're addressing with this data to ask why you're having that bit of a disconnect between the stage that the finches are affecting and the next stage. The finches are not directly affected. So in general, we just seem to decrease diversity uh, of plants, particularly of the seeds. And we've also shown that they're decreasing phylogenetic diversity of the plant community in the seed distribution as well. Now you can see the diversity is a nice metric, but it also can be shaping the composition within a given diversity. So we also look to see whether in these plots the seed composition was increasingly diverging between the controls and the places where uh, finches were excluded. So the expectation is that if finches are shaping the composition of species, you should see an increasing divergence through time between the uh, finch exposures and the places where finches can be. And that appears to be the cases for seed composition. Variation between years is driven largely by the amount of rainfall. So if you correct for that, you see even stronger trends here. And in this case, we do see that there seems to be an effect on the plant species composition as well. So even if there is a bit of a break caused by uh, the germination stage, you do seem to see a signal of what the finches are doing on the seeds in the plants that are emerging from that seed distribution. But that seems to only occur uh, if you do it for a relatively long period of time, presumably because of seed bagging effects. So finches are changing species composition of seeds and plants. So now we want to do a whole bunch more of these exposure experiments across a bunch of different islands with different finch, finch beet distributions. And so if you're a student out there who wants to do this work, please let me know. Now, the other thing we want to ask is, are the individual members of those plant communities evolving in response to the finches? And so that's the next thing I just want to show you our initial data for. And if you were to ask about a particular plant that might be evolving in response to finches, you might think about tribulus. Because tribulus is the famous plant that caused the evolution of large and or small beaks on Daphne Major. It's a very hard seed to get into, it's really well defended, and it seems to be causing very strong selection on finches. Well, maybe the finches are causing strong selection on tribulus traits as well. So this is a really cool plant. They have this maricarp, this wood maricarp with a bunch of seeds in it, and you have lots of them in certain places in the Galapagos that have, some have been eaten and some have not. The finches have a very strong interaction with these uh, seeds. Here I've slowed down a video of a uh, a very large finch that's feeding on a tribulus maricarp, and you can see it raises it up, positions it very carefully, and kind of saws into it with its jaw, then puts it down, picks the seed out with its tongue, picks it back up, and then does a very careful manipulation again to break into the next place where a seed is in that maricarp. So they have this very strong interaction between uh, finches and this particular plant. So we wanted to ask, are finches influencing selection and evolution of this plant? And we figured that the best way to do this would be to start with an experiment. So we enter Mark Johnson. And uh, so his basically your task was to take a whole bunch of tribulus maricarps, individually measure and mark them, uh, and manipulate some of them, and then put them out in nature and see what the finches do to them. If you speed things up, you see all kinds of interesting behavior by all of us. There's a lot more of it. I, I, I 
encourage you to watch it. It's like <laughs> so here are the results that we found. So you have this experiment where you put out the seeds like this, uh, and then you come back later and see which ones have been eaten and which ones have not been eaten. And in this case, I'm showing you the difference oops, in a number of different plant traits. No, we kind of want to. I kind of want to watch that again, don't you? Rather <laughs> look at data. Um, so what you're seeing is that the eaten seeds tend to be smaller in a bunch of dimensions than the seeds that aren't eaten, suggesting that in this case, in this experiment, selection is favoring larger seeds. So now we know that this particular plant does seem to be under selection by the finches. The next step is to ask. Are different finch beak distributions differentially influencing the selection of this plant? Now, one cool thing about this plant is you can see that basically the carcasses are still there after it's been killed by the finch. So you don't have to measure them in advance. You just go out and pick them up off the ground, see which ones have been eaten and which ones haven't been eaten, measure them, and you can do a point in time estimate of selection. So we've been going to uh, picking these up from a bunch of different places on uh, different islands and different locations on islands, asking if the properties of tribulus differs among those islands, and if the pattern of selection differs among islands. If it does, then we can use that as a substrate for understanding how finches are potentially shaping the coevolution with this plant. So here's just some preliminary data. There's different levels of seed predation uh, on tribulus at different locations. And it seems that the predation on this plant is greatest when the conditions are driest, which is what we expect because this is a pretty hard plant to, uh, to get into. And really, the finches just ignore it if it's wet conditions and there's a lot of food available. In addition, we see that selection is varying across space. So here are a bunch of different samples. The colors correspond <coughs> to different islands, and the, and the uh, different lines correspond to different populations. And you're looking at the difference in different properties of tribulus seeds, uh, maricarps, in relation to whether they're eaten or uneaten. And if you're looking for a trend, there isn't one. Which is a good thing. Because it means there's spatial variation in natural selection. And so our hope is to link that spatial variation in natural selection to spatial variation in the plant and the tribulus itself, and to spatial variation in the finches, both experimentally and observationally. And so in the end, we hope that the Galapagos system will be a really good place, not just for studying how adaptive radiation works, but for studying how evolution then feeds back to influence other aspects of the environment, community structure, population dynamics, maybe even ecosystem function, and then the genetic basis of those eco elo interactions. So if you want to talk more about eco evo dynamics, it turns out I'm doing a signing of my book at the Oxford, at the Princeton, not at the Oxford, <laughs> at the Princeton booth. Uh, and hopefully you can get one and contribute to uh, my, my favorite current hashtag, which is people who fell asleep reading my book. <laughs> I think I have time for a question or two. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, tribulus also, I think, is evolving partly because of dispersal ability. This is a really woody maricarp, and it disperses basically by nowadays by car tires and people's feet. And so there's probably a lot of selection on it that doesn't have to do with the finches themselves. Instead, it has to do with dispersal. And it's also, teaser, seems to be invasive in the Galapagos. It's not native, we think. So stay tuned for more information about that. Okay, uh, thank you very much, and uh, I hope to talk to you more about it. Okay, the chime's going to go any second, so we might as well have the next talk by uh, Kyoko Kappa.